Defensive capability. You only ever realize how little you have once it's too late, like snacks or time before an exam. In this video, I will explain how you increase your survivability and we tackle the topics in the following order. First, I will explain how different systems work, like armor, shields, point defense and flak. And then three different strategies that you can use as guidelines while building your ship. Keep in mind that every defensive system and strategy has their counters and you won't be able to be great at everything. And the worst thing you can do is being mediocre at all of them. More on that later. Let's start with armor. Probably the easiest way to increase the survivability of your vessel as you force the enemy to chew through massive amounts of HP and there is no way to bypass it. He has to get through there one way or another. But simply stacking blocks isn't optimal. Some strategy is needed. That being armor weaving, prioritization, spaced armor and internal armor for damage reduction in case you lose volatile systems. Armor weaving is the technique of stacking armor that is always displaced by one tile in order to overlap. The reason why you do that is because you force the enemy to burn through more tiles than he would actually need. This way you artificially increase the HP of your frontal armor without adding anything and always build it perpendicular to the expected incoming damage. Next is prioritization. Armor is heavy, and since it's supposed to lend you time to kill the enemy, it's not only useless but borderline crippling if you can't catch up with the kiting ship. Same applies if the roles are reversed. Extra armor won't do you any good if your ship isn't built for close combat in the first place. Which is why you need to evaluate where armor is needed, where little armor is sufficient and where you might only need spaced armor against stray EMP missiles. If an area isn't under a lot of fire, you might want to replace some armor either with empty space or simple structure. Structure is also great for spaced armor. If your entire ship is heavily compressed, EMP strikes or weapons with massive AoE damage will be able to use the warhead to great effect. Spaced armor is rarely thick and therefore light, but protects important systems like reactors or engines by letting the missile explode before its effect can reach those systems. Internal armor can be incredibly valuable if you want a ship that can even turn the tide while being severely damaged. The way that explosions behave is that it will deal a certain amount of damage in a radius. Meaning that if you have enough armor to soak up the damage, the systems that are close by are at least able to survive the blast. Fires will be inevitable, but if you have another reactor on the ship, then the shields can still be functional. Same goes for weapons or engines. Medium reactors are more dangerous, but still manageable. But don't try that with large reactors. Also, while shields are theoretically able to block AoE damage, it's just not worth it to put up that many secondary shield generators if armor can do the same job. Lastly, keep in mind that you will lose some of that frontal armor during a fight. So either more distance or more armor behind the reactor might be needed for that to work on the medium. Armor gets countered by weapons with incredible damage potential like nukes or high precision armaments like beams. Next up, shields. They come in two sizes, but while their general task is the same, their behavior is a bit different. Small shields can project through solid objects while large shields can't. What makes shields special is the fact that they theoretically can supply your ship with infinite health points as long as they don't break. Unfortunately, that not breaking part is easier said than done. There are multiple things that you have to keep in mind. First off, shields don't have a health bar in the traditional sense. Instead, the health of the shield is connected to the battery charge of the generator, meaning that a single battery has 2500 potential shield health in it. Here comes the relevant part. If you are able to supply the shield with one energy per second, the shield gains 2500 HP back per second. In other words, a hostile ship with four standard lasers or two standard cannons will never be able to get through your shield, no matter how long you have to endure the barrage. Sounds great, until you realize that damage tends to escalate rather quickly throughout your journey. So either have a backup plan or keep future encounters in mind with more shields if you have the manpower. Because here's what happens when your shield breaks. It is gone for a while. You need to recharge the entire generator before it is online again. Also, you trade 24,000 HP for 6,000 with zero penetration resistance. Consider the generator as empty space while planning your defense. Speaking of planning, how do you get the most out of your shields? Shields, or rather the crew supplying them, have a weird logic that normally makes sense but gets in the way of steady supply. 
If a shield is missing 3 health, then 3 crew members will get 3 1 charge batteries to the shield, thus constantly supplying it in 1 charge intervals. Same shield medium reactor, 2 crew members will get 2 double batteries to fill it up again. However, this already takes half a second to charge the battery itself, but overall it still works just fine. So a large reactor that provides triple batteries should be perfect, right? Okay, what happened? The problem is that the 3 charge battery is working against us in this case. The crew will start to get a battery once the shield needs power. However, all of these other crew members will wait until the generator needs more than 3 energy, because the first crew member will already supply the necessary energy with his current 3 charge task. Meaning that the moment a second crew member finally starts to help, your shield is already down to half health. The best analogy I can think of are shifting gears. The large reactor only knows two gears, first gear with one crew member as long as it has more than half HP and second gear with two crew members when it's below half HP. The medium reactor has three gears, first with one crew when it's above two thirds HP, two crew members when it's about half and three when it's below one third HP. The small reactor actually behaves the best as long as it can generate enough power, as it knows 6 gears, one for each battery missing in the reactor. That's why you can put 6 crew members on two small reactors and almost all will happily help the generator to not die. Watch closely as the generator draws more crew members to itself as it gets closer to breaking. It is indeed less crew efficient than a medium reactor, but the upside is that it self-regulates its performance depending on stress. If you have the crew available, I would suggest this setup. Otherwise, you might want to go for a medium reactor, as it allows you to supply two shields with six crew members effectively. Same goes for two crew members per small shield on a large reactor. But putting it close to the front is too much of a risk and the travel time plus AI behavior is suboptimal at best. Just remember that these are the maximum numbers for crew per shield. The crew doesn't know that they will be under fire for a few more seconds and they don't preemptively start getting power towards the shield generator that doesn't need it right this millisecond and instead just sit idly by. There is another setup however. You basically take a capacitor instead of a small reactor and treat it the same way as one. Now you have less of an explosive frontal armor. But then you will need dedicated personnel that will carry batteries all the way from your next reactor towards that capacitor. But that's a choice you have to make. A failing shield won't explode with a capacitor but a shield with a reactor might not break in the first place. Try both and see what suits you more. Same formula for the large shield generators. 18 charges. So 18 crew members on small reactors, which I definitely do not recommend, 9 on mediums and 6 on large. And while this might seem counterintuitive, large shields are usually the better option to protect your sides and rear, while small shields are generally better for the front. Why? Because your frontline won't survive long without armor and large shields are incredibly squishy, which is why they will get obliterated once the shields go down or the enemy starts using EMP missiles and disruptors. But they can seriously decrease your weight if you are willing to take that risk. Just do your crew a favor, stay at range and don't be cheap on that point defense. Last three bits about shields as I desperately want to save the flag's reputation. Remember when I said in the laser guide that the disruptors are your best friends against shields as they punch through them? There is a limit. They can only punch through two shields. They just impact on a third like any other projectile. Second is that disruptors can't fire through large shields. However, entire ships can fly through, basically rendering your shields useless. Third is that shields get countered by weapons with high per shot damage like cannons, as they can break shields before they can be recharged and specific counters like disruptors and EMPs. The point defense versus flag debate. Something that you can find in forums, reddit and even my own comment section. So I will try my best to showcase both weapons and maybe try to explain why each weapon has its place in Cosmoteer. Just a heads up that both systems work in their intended role and no they are not identical and can't be substituted by each other. If you want your ship to succeed against missiles, you will need both. Let's start with the easier one, point defense. These things are easy to maintain as they can be charged before the fight and are small enough to be scattered around your ship, basically perfect for protecting small areas or angles where flag would be wasted, flanks and rear ideally. 
but they can also be used at the front if protected heavily by shields. While they are not exactly squishy in comparison to armor, they are still weaker and more importantly need to be spammed if you want them to be useful against entire barrages of cannons and missiles. And here is the big flaw of the point defense. While they are charged at the start of the battle, they can only fire for 2 seconds until they run dry. That is nowhere near enough sustained fire for it to be useful. Even with capacitors, the amount of energy and crew needed to constantly keep them up and firing is just not practical. And while you can use capacitors to charge point defense at the flank and rear, these capacitors will be empty the entire time on the front. So you would need reactors there. But that makes your front extremely weak as the point defense and the hallways take away the sturdiness of your front line. Not the best circumstances to find a reactor in. Also, if they get hit by a single EMP, that's it. Long story short, point defense shouldn't be your only choice if you want to protect your front for prolonged engagements. But you also can't go without them because due to their high fire rate, they are your best bet against high explosive spam as Fleck just wastes 1000 damage per high explosive missile. Speaking of which, the flak. Definitely a weapon with its own flaws, but this is your dedicated projectile sweeper and your best bet against high priority targets like EMP or occasional nuke. 1800 damage per shot in an AoE, 4 shots per second, for 7200 DPS. To put these numbers into perspective, you can one-shot high explosive missiles and even two with one shot if they are close enough to each other, you can two-shot EMP missiles and kill a nuke within four shots or one second. Plus, you can shoot down disruptors, but that's just icing on the cake. Additionally, they don't require energy, and if you put them into defensive mode, they can take down a considerable amount of missiles. Emphasis on considerable. Just plastering your front and point defense or flag won't negate the enemy's missile spam. Ships like Polaris or Alexander will still get a lot of missiles through. There's no way around that. Reason being that you only have 150 meters of range in order to shoot these things down, which is by far not enough. But that's not the point of point defense in Cosmotier. Point defense is supposed to cripple the enemy's firepower by taking away potential damage. The idea of basically turning off an entire weapons class does not work. No matter how much point defense you take, if you have a normal ship and not a min-maxing dedicated point defense ship with over 50 PD or 20 flak cannons, some missiles will go through. That's why you also need shields, armor, speed and a general understanding of your ship and its defensive options. Especially in the late game, your ship won't survive if you just press right click. Try to face an Alexander head on, I dare you. Let's get into the second major topic. Different strategies that you can keep in mind while building your ship. Remember that your ship is unique to you and that you can try all kinds of different battle plans and see if they work. Mine aren't set in stone but serve as a starting point. Starting with survivability through endurance. This is your most basic type of strategy but also one of the most important ones if you decide to brawl up close and personal. You clad yourself in armor and shields with a heavily fortified core while having shields and point defense at your weak spots. Armor weaving and multiple layered small shields are mandatory but you will be rewarded in high firepower as your cannons or beams turn the enemy ship into an afterthought. But all of that weight is your biggest weakness. Your entire wall of armor, shields and point defense are only there to buy yourself time. There is no weapon that won't be able to fire at you, hence the name of the strategy. You want to endure the onslaught longer than the enemy. Also, forget about maneuverability, at least backwards. Sideways is important to dodge the nukes coming your way, but forward momentum is your most important one. If the enemy can kite you, it's over. The best thing you can hope for at that point is that he runs out of shells. Let's flip the roads. Survivability through range. Prime examples would be railguns and missile boats. Lightly armored, lots of shields, lots of reverse engines and spaced armor to keep pesky EMP missiles at bay. You are all about keeping the enemy within your no fun zone while denying him the privilege of a fair fight. It's arguably the most foolproof strategy if used correctly and the enemy has no long range options. However, there is one major downside. This strategy demands that you have high firepower at long range, preferably way more than the enemy. If they are able to keep up or even catch up, your shields and these few tiles of armor will be gone in no time. I would personally recommend to not overdo it on a single craft. Before you start to cripple yourself with a too large ship, try to build more ships that fulfill a certain role that your main ship can't without slowing it down. Additional point defense or even one small reconnaissance ship with a sensor array might be a good investment. The last strategy works for both previous ones but deserves its own spotlight. 
redundancy and damage mitigation. Things won't always go your way. Maybe you get jumped or the enemy gets really lucky with his precision and nails your weak spot five times in a row. Shit happens. However, there are ways to keep on fighting even if your ship gets severely damaged. I already mentioned internal armor and this is precisely why. You will build your ship with modularity in mind, multiple independent offensive and defensive systems that can function on their own and die on their own, without crippling the rest of the ship and continue the fight even under less optimal circumstances. This is of course the most optional strategy but also one of my favorite. It's completely up to you if you start to isolate systems or go for an all or nothing approach. But I would suggest to try it as there is no greater feeling than losing most of your ship and still coming out victorious, especially if you already thought that the fight was lost ages ago. And I hope you start to understand now why it's a bad idea to be mediocre at everything. Some strategies are exclusive to others. You can't be heavily fortified and agile. You can't be extremely compact and redundant. You can't have redundancy and have thick armor across your entire front. You need to pick a combat style with a loadout and defensive setup that complement each other. A close range railgun brawler doesn't make much sense. You don't gain anything from it and the armor makes rail fanning slower or you can just get outflanked. Same goes for cannons where you decide to be very lightly armored and rely on shields. Doesn't work well because you are in disruptor range most of the time. However, don't be discouraged if you get destroyed. As mentioned at the beginning, every strategy has its counters. It doesn't mean that you failed as an engineer. Sometimes an enemy ship is just tailor-made to exploit your shortcomings. Adjust to the new threat and try again. One final mention before we are done, fire extinguishers. They aren't expensive and don't take up much space. Have them close to reactors, engines and volatile weapons like cannons with their ammo storages. Also place multiple ones. Fire spreads quickly and through doors. You want to get rid of them as soon as possible. There is really no need to lose countless systems or even entire battles due to fire. And if you want to be really careful, only connect your different modules, which should be self-sufficient anyway, with airlocks. Fire can only spread through open spaces or doors. Also means that the rest of the ship can't help them in the heat of a fight, but I just want to say that this option exists. This concludes my guides on combat-focused topics in Cosmotea. I hope that I was able to help a good amount of newcomers and maybe even some veterans. It has been a pleasure and I'm really looking forward to what 2023 has in store for us. I for one am definitely not done with Cosmotea and I will continue to play and make content for it if the need arises. But I'm also interested in making a guide about an old love of mine before Kerbal Space Program 2 drops. With that said, thank you for your support and kind words. Captain Caffeine signing off.